Now, with global warming, reduced water supplies and population growth threatening to trigger worsening famines within Africa. We've had a taste of it at the moment here in South Africa. Environmentalists fear that vegetation in Africa may one day be wiped out completely. Now, Jill Farron, a professor of molecular and cell biology at the University of Cape Town, is the world's leading expert in the field of resurrection plants, a unique group of flora that can survive extreme water shortages for large amounts of time and hopes to unlock the genetic codes of drought-tolerant plants that could help keep our vegetation alive in the face of continued droughts here in South Africa, some of the worst weather we've experienced in decades. And Professor Jill Ferret is here to tell us a little bit more. I know it's very difficult to summate the work that you are doing, your life's work, in one introduction, but this is very exciting to me. Obviously, we've been feeling the effects in a very real way of what drought means here in South Africa. Talk to me about these resurrection plants. What are they? How do they work and why have they got you so excited? Oh, Graham, the resurrection plant, the word resurrection plant means resurrect from the dead. And the, when they first um, discovered, they pretty much looked dead, don't they? You don't Absolutely, think that yeah. thing would be alive. They're not dead. They're very much alive. And if you put it in water, which I did last night, so that's about 12 hours. Wow. They green up immediately. I'm going to give you some of these to take home. It's very safe to do with your kids. Very cool. However, yeah. The fact that they can lose that much water is completely unique. No living organism can lose that much water and not die because all our metabolism happens in water. So this, they've evolved an incredible strategy. But the strategy actually has been evolved before in seeds. So you and I go out to, to stock airs on a daily basis, if you like, get a packet <laughs> of seeds, forget to plant them. Four years later, you think, oh, I'll plant them. They're still alive, aren't they? But they're exceptionally dry and you've got, to you've got to put them in water. Same thing's happening here. With these plants. Exactly. So now these, it's hardwired into that genetic code, if yep. you will. How then do we translate this into drought-resistant crops? Because I think farmers immediately would have picked up mm. on that. Um, talk to me about the kind of research that you're doing with these incredible plants. So what I've been trying to do is to gain what I think, what I always say is a comprehensive fundamental understanding. How do they do this? It's pointless just saying, okay, I'm going to look at all the genes and pick that one and put it in. So I need to understand what genes were being involved. What do those genes do? What, what, what's their purpose? And having understood all of that, I've actually come to the conclusion that they're doing nothing different from what a seed is doing. Wow. The biggest implication of that is, of course, that all the genes for desiccation tolerance, and we call this ability to dry, so much desiccation tolerance. All those genes are in seeds or in plants that we are cultivating now because they make dry seeds. So it's there already. It we just needs to, to be turn unlocked. Them on. We have to turn them on. Um, I love the fact that many of these species are found here in South Africa already. Why is that? Is it a, a Karoo thing? Is it a, a climate thing? Why do we have this, this uh, multitude here? Million dollar question. Um, there are species in Brazil and a few in Australia. So I, th I think they've been around for about, we guess, 40 to 60 million years around. But sure. most of them that we've discovered to date seem to be in the Southern African. And it might just be that those are the ones we, we've been looking for. There might be a hell of a lot more out there. So please go around and <laughs> test everything. Starts. Water, water things. I think that the, you mentioned the, that million dollar question, but I think the big question for me is when will this start hitting the market? When will we start seeing this kind of research and technology actually coming to fruition in our crops? Yeah. Well, that's also another million dollar question because it's <laughs> going to cost that much. The big thing is, is cost. My collaborators and I, and this is not a single effort, I promise you, I work with exceptional people both at UCT and abroad. We tip our hats. Yeah, yeah indeed. Uh, we know what to do. Uh, but the big thing is that the rollout's going to take quite a lot of money for us to get to proof of concept. And we think five years with sufficient money. But that I, you know, can't be held too simply because it's always a fact, matter of do we get the funds? Do we get the... And biology goes skew sometimes. Well, I can guarantee you there are some big-name corporates out there taking notice of what you are talking <laughs> about this morning, and you have an open invitation to come back when you make new advancements in this research. But, Professor, thank you so much for the work that you and your team are doing. Really incredible Thank you for stuff. your time. It's been great being here. Awesome and inspiring stuff. On a very inspiring Tuesday morning, we're about to meet another very young superstar who's going to put us all to shame with an athletic feat. Kat?